Good morning, Walden Church. Today we're going to start with a passage from the prophet Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. All right, so what's that about? And what does it have to do with joy? We've been going through a series on joy this fall, and today is our last time together talking about joy. Um, you got the prophet Jeremiah, right? And he's, he's warning the people, okay? He's warning them that coming soon, there is going to be a reckoning for their behavior. Jeremiah is calling the people out. He's telling them that they're arrogant for putting their security and safety in the wrong things. And, and God's not going to put up with it any longer. And if they really wanted safety and security, then they needed to come back to God. They had to stop building their own kingdom and start building God's kingdom. The people are reveling in all of their blessings, their goodwill, but they had forgotten who it was that had blessed them. Verse 23 says, the wise men are boasting. Hey, we're smart, right? We're smart. We have knowledge. You know, we have, we have technology. Look what we can do. Look at all the things we can accomplish. Look at all the things we can build. God says, eh, you're not that smart. Sometimes it seems like we're so smart that we don't need God. You know, a lot of the current modern atheist movement comes from this false sense of enlightenment. They argue that because they have the ability to reason and think that they have evolved and somehow have moved beyond the need for God. How could that be? Well, we teach evolution in school, that that's how mankind came into existence. Our schools tell us that science reveals things that we previously misunderstood, and now we have knowledge, and that makes us better. You know, way back in 1966, the cover of Time magazine declared God is dead, much to everyone's chagrin. And it was a quote from uh, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche said that the intellect and the science that we've, we've accumulated has helped us grow up, and we've grown out of our need for God. He said, God is dead in the hearts of modern men, killed by rationalism and science. So knowledge, knowledge is power. Just like in Jeremiah's time, we are, we are also prideful in our ability to reason and think and discover and build. But Jeremiah says, life is not about us. It's never been, it's always been about him. Our intellect and our abilities, those are blessings from God. And if we have an ability, then we should use that ability to glorify him. Next, Jeremiah writes, let not the mighty man boast in his might. So aside from technology and knowledge, another pursuit of people is power. And those with power tend to boast about how powerful they are. Those in power like to flaunt their power. And power is another thing that we think that we need. We think we want it. You ever thought about how much it costs to become president? A presidential campaign costs about $52 million to run, just to run. That means before someone becomes president, they spend $52 million to become president. Wow, that job better pay well. It doesn't. <laughs> the president gets paid $400,000 a year, and they have an expense account of about another $500,000. I've often wondered why a person would spend millions and millions of dollars to get a job that pays a couple hundred thousand dollars. One word, power, right? Jeremiah warns, don't be so full of yourself. Life is not about us, it never has been, it's about him. 
your power and your position, they are a blessing from God. And if we have any power of our own, we should use whatever power we have to glorify him. There is a responsibility that comes from having power. Yes? Do you know who had all the intellect? Do you know who had all the power? Jesus. The book of Philippians says that Jesus had all the ability and all the power, and yet he became a servant. Jesus modeled responsibility for us in that upper room when he washed the feet of his disciples. The one who was all-powerful was not boasting about how powerful he was. Instead, he was modeling for us humility. And he didn't take a position of power or prestige. In Mark chapter 9, we see a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. It says, after they arrived at Capernaum and settled in the house, Jesus asked his disciples, what were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. He sat down, called the 12 disciples over to him and said, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. See, just like most people, they wanted to be the greatest. They wanted to be first. They wanted to have power. They wanted to have prestige. They thought that all of that would come to them, more of it would come to them, if they could say they were Jesus' right-hand man. People would recognize them, give them respect. They could boast in their position, boast in their power. But Jesus said no. Approximately 600 years before, God tells the people through Jeremiah, don't boast about how powerful or prestigious you are. Be humble, which was also the same thing Jesus taught, right? Humbleness, humility. Last, Jeremiah gives us one more directive about what not to boast about. He says, let not the rich man boast in his riches. In other words, don't brag about how much money you have. I know that everyone uh, here this morning has known someone who wants everyone to know how much money they have. People who do that are calling attention to themselves. They say, look at me, look at how much money I've got. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't believe there's anything wrong with money. The Bible says that it's only the love of money that's wrong. So again, it falls back on pride. You, you, you love your big home. You love your possessions. You love showing all those things off. Am I saying there shouldn't be wealthy Christians? Oh no. I believe God makes people rich. But I also believe that Christians are given wealth for a reason. I believe God blesses generous people with wealth. I believe God blesses compassionate people with wealth. Wealthy believers give back to God because they recognize where that blessing comes from. But Jeremiah warns that that's even not something to brag about. And interestingly, all the while he tells us not to brag or boast about our wisdom or power or wealth, Jeremiah does say that there is one thing we can and should brag about, and that's him, God. Verse 24 says, but lend him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. God says, if you want something to brag about, brag about me. Last week we said, joy-filled Christians share their joy. We've been talking about joy this fall, the source of joy, how to find joy. And in the Jeremiah passage, the prophet begins with three warnings. And in truth, those three things are all places where we think security and safety and protection come from. Now, if you have intellect or power or money, you're set, right? You're so protected, you're so safe. That's all I need. If I had intellect, power, and money, I wouldn't need anything else. We learned that at a really young age. You tell your kids, you need to go to college. Why? So you can get smart. Why? So you can get a job. Why? So you can get money. Intellect, power, money. 
those things lead to joy? Is that true? Because if you ask most people what they truly want in life, most people would say they want to be happy, right? They want to be happy. And then we're sold this bill of goods about intellect, power, and money as if those things lead to happiness. But are smart people the happiest people? Do do the people who have the most power seem to be the happiest people to you? What about people who are rich? Does being rich make you happy? If that were true, then those things uh, could also be taken away, right? You could take those things away, and then if you took those things away, then the people would no longer be happy. If you lose power, lose money, you'd lose happiness. So obviously, what would be better is to have something that can't be taken away. I don't want to lose my joy. Joy should not be contingent on a circumstance. Jeremiah says, just boast in knowing God. Boast in knowing God. Then it's not about circumstances, right? Knowing God is really that good. If I lose money or I lose power, do I still know God? Of course. God is the greatest thing I could ever experience. And the relationship with him is the most wonderful thing ever. I don't have to be rich to connect with God. He made the universe. He owns it all. I don't have to be powerful or to have connections, to have intimacy with God. Having a bond with God has nothing to do with how smart I am. In fact, the poorest person on earth can experience the joy of God. The stupidest person on earth could feel what it feels like to be loved by God. The least influential person has just as much access to God as anyone. That's why the good news is so good. And that's why it spread back in Jesus' day, because the good news was that grace was free. That you didn't have to be a king or a priest to have access to God. You could be a shepherd. You could be a condemned criminal. You could be a woman caught in adultery. You could be a child. But I know the reason why we heavily rely on intellect and wealth and power, because we think those things bring us security and safety and comfort. But if those things are removed, we pray that God would bring them back. But did you ever stop and think about why safety and stability are sometimes removed from our life? It's so that we get pushed back to God. Why does the parent throw the child into the deep end of the pool? To scare them? To drown them? No. To teach them how to swim. You see, nobody thanks God for suffering. Nobody thanks God for pain. But looking back on your life, it's always the pain that draws you closer. Paul agrees with this. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. You see how Paul writes about how much pressure he's under? He says, utterly beyond our strength, right? Not just beyond, utterly beyond. And when you're in those situations, that's when you ask God, why? Why? Why is this happening? Why me, God? Paul says, I am in an impossible situation. And so that, he says, God would teach me to stop relying on intellect, stop relying on influence, stop relying on money, and rely more on him. It's fun to be wanted, right? When someone calls out, help, when I get to step in with my tool belt on and say, I can control this, 
I can make this work. But what happens when life is so overwhelming that you'd rather be dead and nothing can get fixed? That's what Paul says. That's how bad it was, he says. I felt like dying, so I turned to the one who can raise the dead. Paul tells his reader that trials are a good thing because they force you to rely on God. I wonder if that's how God raises us, you know? That he occasionally throws us into the deep end. I wonder if he raises us that way, then does he also parent the world that way? Does he raise the world that way? I mean, what do you think? Do you feel like things in the world do you, feel, do you feel like things in the world are getting better? Or doesn't it seem like things are getting more and more out of control? Are things getting better? No, they're getting worse. Why? Is God no longer in control? Can't he fix it? Of course he can. He can. Of course he is still in control. But... I bet he is waiting for more people to realize that he is the only solution out of this mess. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. You know what that means? It means you are not in control. Ever. It's an illusion. It means intellect, power, wealth, they are useless safety protocols. Your 401k is worthless. The fact that you diversify is worthless. Your gun by your nightstand is worthless. Because unless the Lord builds the house, those who build in labor, they're doing it in vain. Are you going to have a healthy child? Only if God wills it. You're going to keep your job? Only if God wills it. Are you going to have a successful marriage? If God wills it. Are you going to have enough to retire on? Only if God wills it. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. I've got a huge army. We spend so much money on military and defense. I don't care how big your army is. If God wants that city destroyed, it will be. We are only secure and we are only protected if the Lord wills it. Look at verse 2. Psalm 127, verse 2. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. The psalmist says your work, your labor, your security. It's all in vain. Well, I don't like that. How can I make sure that I'm not laboring in vain? How can I make sure the Lord is on my side? How can I make sure the Lord wills it? You ever read the book of Haggai? Haggai is only two chapters long and it's all warning. Haggai chapter 1 says, Consider your ways. You have sown much, harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Sounds a lot like Psalm 127. These people are laboring in vain. Just toil. Why? What can they do? Let's fix this. Come on. What's Haggai's answer? Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Jerusalem had been destroyed 
And the first thing the people did was they worried about their own stuff. They fixed their own house. They gathered their own possessions together. They replaced and repaired their own stuff. And the temple of the Lord sat in ruins. And they worked all day, and at the end of the week, their money was gone. And they said, where did all our money go? And God said, I blew it away. Why? You know why. Because you only think of yourself. God says, you first build my kingdom, then you worry about yours. You want security? Do something for me. Sounds like, a, like the same thing Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. A message from the Old Testament and then repeated by Jesus. We better listen because it actually sounds like another command. Seek first the kingdom of God with your intellect. Seek first the kingdom of God with your influence. Seek first the kingdom of God with your money and then. But what about my bills? What about my kid? He always needs new clothes and now I gotta take a trip to the dentist. My truck needs new tires. In that same teaching, Jesus says, therefore do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Listen, I can be in first and last and perfect and ultimate security. I can. I can be in the most perfect umbrella of security as long as God is my first priority. My short time on earth needs to be about building his kingdom, not mine. One more thing and then we'll wrap this up. Psalm 37, I want you to picture this being read by the oldest person you know. I want you to hear that voice in your head, okay? The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall, not, he shall not be cast headlong. For the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously, and his children become a blessing. The author, in his old age, in his wisdom, says, I've seen a lot of things in my lifetime. Right? But one thing I've never seen is the righteous forsaken. God takes care of his children. Yeah, but I have a 401k. Oh yeah? <laughs> I have God. I have three medical degrees. So what? I have God. I have a 357 Magnum in every single room of my house. You think that's gonna save you? I have God. Seek him first. Seek him first. Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. You know, for all the love, and goodness that God talks about, he sure kind of comes across as a hypocrite sometimes, doesn't he? I mean, if God loves me so much, why is he gonna send me to hell, right? Doesn't he, isn't, he, isn't he forcing me to love him? I have to love him or else. I love him or I'm punished. I love him or I die. That doesn't sound very loving. Yeah? But that doesn't make sense. I thought I had free will. I have, I have free will. I should be able to choose whatever path I want. Okay. You, you tell me then. You, you tell me. You're, you're a loving parent, 
right? You're a loving parent. Jesus says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it'll be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, would you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would you give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? What's that about? Well, it's an example, right? If your child is hungry, you're, you're, you're a parent. Your child is hungry and they have two choices. Door number one has a cooked fish behind it. Door number two has a live, deadly snake. Now you can see the choices and you can see both outcomes, but your child has free will. Now, if I love my child with all my heart, then naturally I will allow them to make their own choice and they can suffer the fate of either one, right? Because I love them and they have free will. No, heck no. I'm gonna flat out tell my child which door leads to life. But what if they still want door number two? Do I just let them? No, I jump in their path and I block that door. Why? Because I'm a mean parent. <laughs> no, because I'm a loving parent. Well, what if they fight to get past me? What if they struggle with a handle? Well, then I guess I threaten them. If you choose this door, you will die. Geez, mom and dad, sounds like you're forcing me to take door number one. That doesn't sound very loving. Well, consider the opposite. I let them open door number two. They're bitten by a snake and they're poisoned and they're dying. And they look at me and ask, did you know? Yes. Why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you try harder to stop me? Don't you love me? Our God is a loving God, but he wants you to experience the greatest thing in this world. And he wants you to have access to the most perfect thing. That's himself, him. So God does everything he can. He sends you warning after warning. He shoots up flares. He sends out search parties. He lures you. He tempts you. He throws everything at you, even the kitchen sink. And yes, he even threatens you because he has to. God has to do everything he can because he wants you to choose life. Even as you sit there right now, why are you here? Why did you come here? Because you want God to fix something this morning? You're trying to earn heaven points? This, all of this, this is not religion. It's a relationship. And joy comes from just knowing him. Just knowing him. I hope that's why you're here this morning. Not to sing, not to hear a message, not to connect with friends. I hope not. There's only one reason to be here. God. Nothing else you pursue ever will be good enough. Nothing else you pursue will bring you security. Nothing else you pursue will bring you joy. It's his kingdom come and his will be done. On our first week together, I read you a quote from John Piper. Christian hedonism says this, God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. Hedonism is happiness. It's joy, it's excessive joy. He is the greatest thing we could ever experience. 
And as Christians, we're always talking about the good news, right? Sharing the good news. Hey, I want you to hear the good news. Did you know that the good news is not the cross? God is the good news. Your relationship with God is the good news. You can have access to God. All of him. That's the good news. Not what he provides for you. Not his rewards, not his blessing, just him. Just God. That should be enough. Just him. I came across another good John Piper quote, and we'll end with this. Piper writes, the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends you ever had on earth, and all the food you ever liked, and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed, and all the natural beauty you ever saw, and all the physical pleasures you ever tasted, and no human conflict, and no natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there? And then he says this, and the question for Christian leaders is, do we preach and teach and lead in such a way The people are prepared to hear that question and answer with a resounding no. Heaven is not heaven without God. He is enough. That relationship with him is enough. He is the source of all joy. John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's it. That's it. He is enough. Just him. Just God. The Bible says it can't be heaven that you're in love with, and it can't be hell that you're afraid of. It's just him. And you can have all of him. And all you have to do is admit that you're a sinner. And there's there's no shame in that. There's no shame in admitting that you're not perfect or that you're not strong enough or that you're not smart enough or that you don't have enough influence or don't have enough power or don't have enough wealth. If heaven was a reward for only perfect people, then nobody would ever go. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And guess what? When you become a Christian in that moment, in that second, you are still imperfect and you are still broken and you are still a sinner. But see, when you come to a church and you sit next to these other brothers and sisters, you become part of a family and this family accepts you for all your faults. And we all sit here forgiven. We admit that we're sinners, but we're a family who is forgiven. And we are a family who believes in Jesus. If you believe that God became a man, that God walked this earth and did his best to be the example, to show us what love and mercy and grace and forgiveness looked like, and that Jesus stands before each person and now stands before you and offers you a relationship with God that leads to a new beginning, that leads to a new life. Not that he's one of many options, that he is the only option. Acts 4 says there is no salvation by anyone else, and there's no other name under heaven given among people by which we can be saved. That's all it takes. If you could admit that you're a sinner and that you believe God sent his Son, And the Bible says the only thing you have left to do is confess it. Romans 10 says if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A new beginning, a new life. It's that easy. Having access to the ultimate source of joy, having access to the one and only God, it's that easy. 
And if that sounds like the life you now want, because it sounds like the life you've always wanted, then I would invite you to bow your heads and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending me your son, Jesus, so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin and also from myself and also from the habits and the hurts and the hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and I want to repent and I want to live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. I would invite you, if you prayed that prayer, to connect with the local church. From wherever you are sitting, from wherever you are watching in the world, find a local church and plug in. You don't have to drive 30, 45 minutes away. The church right around the corner can do. They need you. They need your intellect. They need your influence. And yes, they need your money. They need all of you. Everything that God made you to be, that little community needs you to be a part of their family so that you can serve and continue to build God's kingdom. We are here for him in this short amount of time that we have. And you will find great joy in being a part of a community. You will find great joy in finding people who have gone through and struggled with the same things that you have. You will find great joy that even when you face trials and loss and hardships, there are people that will surround you, hold you, support you, pray for you like never before. You will find great joy in knowing the Lord. You will find great joy in growing and maturing in Him. You will find joy, as the Bible says, that surpasses all understanding. It can't be felt or just described. It has to be experienced and you can experience it. Plug into your local church. Begin to be a part of the body of Christ. Build his kingdom. Because he's enough. He is. He's enough. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.